Live from the Mandalay Convention Center in Las Vegas, Nevada, it's The Cube at IBM Insight 2014. Here is your host, Dave Vellante. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to IBM Insight. We're here in Las Vegas at the Mandalay Bay. Tim Moran is here. He's the Director of Interactive at WNEP-TV. We're talking analytics. We're going to talk Watson. Tim, welcome to theCUBE. Thanks for coming Dave, on. Dave, thanks. Appreciate it. So, uh, we were just talking off camera about your background. You're a coder, you know, turned sort of interactive analytics guy. So let's start with WNEP. What's the, what's the focus of the, the network? Sure, sure. So um, WNEP-TV is a, a broadcast television network that's part of the Tribune Media Group. Um, the Tribune Media Group as, as, a, as a whole operates just about 62 television stations countrywide. Um, and along with that, we have a whole host of broadcast media websites that average anywhere from you know, 200 to 300 million page views on a monthly basis. So, we're developing a, um, a significant on-air and online marketplace that we can really help to try to just custom tailor uh, messages to our viewership. So, everybody talks about how you got to be data-driven these days. How is, how is media becoming data-driven? How has that changed in your, in your observation and your career? Oh, it's data-driven in every way. So, um, you know, considering the fact that so much of what we do is going mobile right now, um, there's a big challenge in trying to figure the best way to present the proper amount of information to our mobile viewers that also makes sense um, when it's converted over to the desktop viewers. So, you know, we've got one story, we've got um, multiple different platforms to put it out there, and uh, you know, it can't be too long, it can't be too short. Uh, so we use uh, analytics, so primarily we use um, you know, Google Analytics and different tracking methodologies to um, try to take a look at what our ideal uh, time spent on site is, if there's a lot of bounce or drop um, on various pieces of content, uh, just to try to dive deep and figure out exactly why that's happening. So, you, you essentially monetize the 200 to 300 million with a advertising, we do. Is, and, it's, and it's sort of page view driven mm -hmm. primarily, so mm -hmm. you got to have huge numbers yeah. to compete in that business. Yeah, right. um, you know, in the past it was enough just to sell advertising based on page views. So now, volume has scaled to the point that anybody can sell advertising on any uh, website that they can start with GoDaddy. Um, you know, it's selling this advertising in an intelligent way so that we can legitimately go back to our sponsors and our advertisers to say, okay, you know, your investment was X, but we can help you to track the fact that your return on that investment was hopefully some uh, order of magnitude greater. Yeah, so um, how transparent are you with your metrics with with advertisers and with the broader community, obviously uh, advertisers want to see the numbers, so mm -hmm. you presume you share them. Yeah. So what do you share? How do you share? Great, that's a great question. Um, you know, we share as much as we can, um, and it's kind of a vague answer. It's, it's really dependent on a case-by-case -case basis, but ultimately we need to know that the advertiser has an exact picture of what they're investing in. Are they buying impressions on a website? Um, are they running a behavioral targeting campaign with us where they can approach a particular demographic, say, you know, women 18 to 49 that have the um, you know, desire to buy a car within the next 30 to 60 days. So we need to show them how we can deliver that on a case-by-case -case basis. So it's objectives-based, really. Uh, it's, you yeah, sit basically. down with the client, what are you trying to, you know, yeah. what's your objective, who are you trying to reach? Yeah. And with 200 to 300 million uniques, mm -hmm. I mean, you've got pretty much any demographic that I've Well, it's 200 three, to 300 million page views. Oh, um, page views, sorry. Are, right, right. You know, a certain portion so a of that. It's a subset of that, right. Yeah, but still, big number. It's a growing audience, and um, you know, if you take a look at uh, Comscore, is a national uh, sure. ranking company um, for a lot of different uh, verticals. Comscore ranks their top 15 every month in terms of which web properties are the most trafficked, which uh, web properties have the most viewership. And uh, you know, it's always the Google sites number one, it's always the Facebook pages number two, Twitter's up there. Um, with our aggregated traffic between desktop and mobile, uh, we're a top 15 property. Um, really? Worldwide. And, and most of your traffic is mobile these days, or is it it's, even mixed? It's or? really shifting towards mobile. Um, you know, compared to three years ago, where it was a much smaller percentage, now it's 
such a significant percentage. Um, you know, I'm not going to say it's the majority just yet, but it's going there. But it's trending in that direction. It is. What about the user experience? I I'm sure you guys have this conversation all, all the time. Um, how do you optimize that? Do I download an app? Are you building in you know, sort of native mobile, mobile sure. first? I wonder if we could talk about that a little sure, bit. Sure, absolutely. Um, whenever we have a new product that comes out, when I say a product that you know, could refer to an app, um, it could refer to a microsite that's being developed for one of our stations, um, it needs to work on all platforms. It just has to, because if it doesn't work on mobile, but it works on desktop, it just it doesn't make sense. So um, you know, we could start with our and when I say desktop, I refer to just you know, standard laptops. Um, it needs to be responsively designed. So you know, no matter what size uh, device you're looking at our content on, it will scale to fit the device appropriately. And scaling means that it's going to scale the content and it's going to scale the advertisements you know, to a, a layout that we've tested over a period of time and that shows, um, you know, produces great usability results. Now, we do have a suite of apps too. Each of our stations has um, at least one mobile app. Um, and when I say one, that means both iPhone and Android. Um, just about all of them have an uh, iPad app as well. And you know, there's definitely a lot of us usability concerns there. Um, not so recently, but recently enough that the conversation is still relevant is um, you know, discussion around flash video. So we couldn't necessarily play flash video in terms of our broadcast news stories on certain devices because it just it wouldn't work you know, on Apple devices. So, you know, the stats and the analytics show us that there's enough of an audience there and it's that important to us to make that something that we take into consideration. So, I, I like, as a technology guy, I like to think in terms of the stack, right? And if mm -hmm. you think about the, the media business, it's got, whether it's, you know, infrastructure, you got tools, you know, to build on top of that, you got applications, and now you have this data layer. And then from there, you build up design and production and mm -hmm. distribution and partnerships and, and so forth. How is that so-called stack changing? Are you like heavily leveraging the cloud? Uh, are you using sort of, I, you mm -hmm. talk about mobile apps, data is this new layer. I wonder if we could talk about how that stack is evolving and transforming. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, availability first and foremost is one of the major considerations of any business of our nature. You know, we just always need to be there. There can never be any downtime or any outage. Uh, recently, we partnered with WordPress VIP, which partners, um, it powers, uh, you know, such things as like the NFL blogs. You know, a lot of um, TechCrunch. SiliconANGLE. Know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. We use so. WordPress. I mean, why not? Perfect. And you know what? It just right? it always works. Yeah. Their technology is always there. So that's the foundation. That's where all of our content is stored. Um, video. We use different partners. Um, you know, to it depends on basically what the video product is that'll determine which partner we have. Um, either if it's pre-recorded video or if it's live streaming video, um, that's the equivalent of watching our broadcast station. Mm -hmm. um, then the next layer um, in this stack is the advertising overlay. So the advertising overlay is you know, also a very critical component because that's what makes it work. You know, that's what makes um, it possible for us to invest in these technologies in the first place. So with this advertising layer, you know, we need to start becoming more intelligent in the ways that we take a look at the, um, the effectiveness of campaigns, um, you know, just the way that our audiences respond to these campaigns. And that's part of the reason why I'm here, you know, just um, learning about IBM Watson and cognitive thinking and everything that can be provided um, tool-wise to us that we could take advantage of. You know, I saw a demo of Watson this morning and um, I forget the name of the company, but the gentleman typed in um, to this analytical engine that he had, uh, do school buses cause cancer? And within a fraction of a second, Watson not only had an answer, but it had supporting um, you know, material behind it. So I found out that while school buses produce carbon uh, dioxide emissions, <laughs> that there's probably a very small chance that children will get yeah, cancer from school buses. Connection. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's, you know, the stack is evolving in terms of it used to be enough to serve those ads, but now we need to understand them and make them better. So talk a little bit more about that. You're excited about Watson. Everybody knows Watson from the standpoint of you know, healthcare, mm -hmm. um, and then certain other use cases that are emerging. Talk about how you potentially could see using a platform like Watson. Oh my God, I mean we can use Watson. Just from the past, well I got here last night and I learned a little bit about Watson last night and then there were two sessions I sat in this morning 
besides the keynote. So just from that brief exposure, um, I used to think there was going to be this huge barrier to entry in terms of you know, using Watson. Like Watson seemed like it was this technology that was only going to be available to you know, the biggest research hospitals mm -hmm. or you know, um, government installations, things like that, um, you know, major customers that are used to using this advanced technology. But you know, it's not the case now. IBM has really brought this platform, it's brought this tool, Watson, this you know, intelligence to the masses, if you will. So, we can use this in terms of analyzing our advertising data, you know, just trying to make our campaigns work better so it not only provides a better result for our advertisers but also for our viewers. But then go a step further and say, Watson can also take a look at um, any data that we would give to it regarding the analytics of our websites and help us to be able to potentially fine tune uh, our content delivery what types of content we have um, that we're presenting to our viewership, what they respond to the best, what they don't respond to, to really help to drive an increase in the quality of user experience. So how would it work? You would load up Watson with all kinds of data, yeah. and then it would sort of learn and yeah. sort of autodidactic over time, it gets smarter, and then who interacts with, with Watson in theory? Would it be the, the, the business users? Or do, you, do you need a sort of data jock layer like you might with Google Analytics mm -hmm. to a point? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, users can use Google Analytics as well, but to really get value out of it, you might want to have somebody who really knows how to you know, flex the muscles of, of Google Analytics or Watson. How do you see that evolving organizationally? Organizationally, you will have to have a tech layer there to implement it. I mean, that's just fact. But you don't need that research institution level <laughs> you know, tech layer in place. So it seems to me from what I've heard recently is that you develop a set of data and you give it to Watson, and a lot of the time in the past used to be when setting up data warehouses or you know, any type of data reporting, um, you know, talking about and defining the schema, um, you know, right. defining the, the data sets and things like that. Well, you don't need to do that necessarily with Watson. You give Watson your data and it contextualizes this data and it builds its own schema so that it can organize and analyze this data um, in ways that best suits its architecture, if you will. So, in any event, the people ultimately that would be using Watson, to answer your question, just about anybody. I mean, you could type natural language into a Watson command prompt if that's the type of Watson product you're using, and it gives you an English answer. So that notion of, of different schema model, different mental model for schema, because today your schema is largely determined by Google Analytics, mm -hmm. right? whatever it can and can't do. Mm -hmm. um, it's a whole different mindset. It is. talking about with Watson. And the data, I mean, data will come from all over the place, but data will still come from you know, Google Analytics or Omniture or whatever package that you use for your analytics suite. I mean, there's any number of them out there. Um, but it's taking that data and acting on it in a way that makes sense. I mean, there's so much data that we produce. I mean, you can look at this data till you're blue in the face. It's just not humanly possible to analyze and understand all of the data that comes out of you know, these different suites of products. Well, Watson can help you do that. Right, and so, okay, so I as a business user could interact with, with Watson. Mm -hmm. Are you worried about that? Um, sort of opening up the floodgates of, 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 of queries, and, or is that something that you have a specific objective to try to catalyze? I don't think that you should be worried about it, just because if you are, then you're not looking at it the right way. You know, you should be excited about this tool and excited about what it can do for you. I mean, I don't work for IBM, so don't, you know, make this think that it sounds like an IBM commercial, but you know, that's mostly the reason that I'm here, is to learn about this product, and the more that I hear about it, and the more I learn about it, um, it's just, it's exciting. I wonder if I could ask you about um, engagement as a metric. Sure. Um, certainly, you know, page views, time on site, bounce rates, all those wonderful things that you get out of Google Analytics, which content is driving the most sort of interest in terms of viewership. How about engagement? Is that something that's a metric that you care about, that you look out, that, that, that look at, that advertisers care about? Absolutely, so. Um, How do you we, measure that? I mean, engagement could be as simple as ones and zeros. Either somebody engaged with the content or they didn't. Um, but how do you define engagement? Mm -hmm. So an engagement could be a click on an ad or it could be um, somebody specifically going and reading uh, a news story um, that you put out there. But engagement could be looked at in the broader sense of the term in that 
maybe somebody just looked at an image on the screen. You know, they visually engaged with something. Maybe somebody paused um, on a title of a news story when they were scrolling through a list and they hovered over that longer than any of the other stories. I mean, is that an engagement? You know, you can call any number of things engagements, but it's ultimately how we can use the data that's generated by any number of those things to then, you know, make the user experience tailored and you know, that much more valuable to the viewer. Tim, what's your philosophy on social media? I mean, obviously you use social media. Um, how do you use social media? You, you know, everybody's using it. Obviously it's a great distribution channel, um, but there's nuances. Like the data, a lot of times you know, the data's locked inside of whatever, it's Twitter or Facebook, mm -hmm. LinkedIn, and you know, you can get some data and metadata out of the API, you know, there's other things that you can do. You can certainly buy data from data services, which like Ganip, which now Twitter owns, and other, others. Um, what's your philosophy there, and how are you using social media? Um, just philosophies around social media, I think they're always growing. So it's such an important part of who we are. It's such an important part of, pretty much should be any business um, mm -hmm. at this stage of the game. Um, social media is a venue where we can connect with our viewers who may not necessarily see us over the air or through any of the other channels that we use. Now that being said, how do we analyze that engagement? Like you said, there's any number of tools that can help you to analyze um, social media engagement um, and also the value that your social media properties use. And it's just a matter of, I mean, a lot of them have these front ends and they're graphical and you could take a look at what people are you know, interacting with and responding to. But um, you know, it's a tool. It's another tool in the, in the bag. So, how about your philosophy on, uh, you mentioned earlier, live video mm -hmm. content. You guys stream your TV shows pretty we do. much? It's live, so as a user I can just come in and, mm -hmm. yeah, and, we do. and, and watch TV? Um, so we do it actually one of two ways. So we go the pre-roll video route, so that's where you're reading a, a story and you want to watch the video content that's associated with it. I mean, excuse me, not pre-roll video, the actual video. Um, that's embedded short into form, the story. Yeah, the short form video yeah. route. So you, you click play and it plays that little news clip and you see the story, you're happy with the content, great. Um, we also do live streaming, so whenever there's, for example, a broadcast on air, um, you're always going to be able to watch that online, either on a laptop, on an iPad, on a mobile device, um, through in an any app, location. In right. any location, through an app, through a mobile browser, it doesn't matter. Because if we start creating barriers where people can't find our content, oh, well, you can't get it through a mobile browser, but you can get it through um, our iPhone app, then you've already alienated these people and they're not going to go download the app. So you need to make it readily accessible to everybody. And, but a lot of uh, TV operations put up barriers. I mm -hmm. mean, as a user, I know this, mm -hmm. I get frustrated sometimes. Now maybe that's, maybe it's NFL imposed, for example, or, but you're saying you guys are pretty open about that. Now, I mean, if you're talking about an NFL imposed blackout, that's different. You yeah, know? sure. So I mean, that's something that's you out can't of control the, that, the right? television network's control, but. But, some, but, but, but others, other, I do notice that where you have to go through certain hoops, mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe you got to sign in, and that's okay, I'm cool with signing in, mm -hmm. especially if I can use Twitter, LinkedIn, or Facebook, but mm -hmm. you know, how do you sort of adjudicate the, the hurdle rate to get in versus the sort of openness of the platform to get the viewer? Is it, are you sort of, sounds like you lean toward more open. Well, you, you need to be open, in, at least in my opinion, and you always need to be evolving, because what might be considered open today might be a huge pain in the butt tomorrow to somebody that's trying to <laughs> you know, get our content. Um, why do some media companies do that? I don't think they do it on purpose in a lot of instances. I just think that certain media companies are more advanced than others, but that's just like with any industry, right? any vertical. Um, you know, we're just fortunate to be able to have the backing of you know, the senior management um, that allows us to be able to work to develop these technologies that help us to put our content out there as easily as possible for everybody. Yeah, so what do you see as the future of your, your business? I mean, obviously you guys do a lot of TV, but you also have, mm -hmm. it sounds like written content, you've got editorial, you've got editors at the back end, mm -hmm. chopping up video. Mm -hmm. Things are changing, where do you see it all going? I think in terms of you know, the context of what the folks you know, watching us right now are probably interested in, just being data driven. I think that it's so important to not only feel that you're doing your best job with the product that you produce, but to be able to First of all, show that, you can, that you're doing that through some kind of cognitive thinking application, um, but then also to use that same technology, like an IBM Watson, um, as a tool, again, to help cultivate and craft your message and how you get that to the people who want it. 
So last question, we're getting the hook here. Sure. Um, you came out of the coder world. I did. So young people out there, maybe coders, developers, interested in applying that, what advice would you give them? Um, I'm a trained software engineer, and I had gotten myself into media. Um, you know, what advice would I give them? I think that if you're starting as a young coder, you know, if you're developing apps, if you're writing systems, doesn't matter who you work for like I did, just immerse yourself in the business that you're in. Don't lock yourself in a closet thinking that the app that I'm developing is great, and it could be, you know, and that's wonderful, but learn as much as you can about the business aspect of it too because not only will that help you grow as a professional, but I think that will help to better inform your development of those products. All right, we'll leave it there. Tim Moran, thanks very much for coming great. to theCUBE. Really Dave, a pleasure having you. you on. All right, keep it right there everybody. The Cube will be back. We're at IBM Insight 2014 at Mandalay Bay. Be right back. <laughs>